Krieg here with Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, astrophysicist at Manhattan's American Museum of Natural History and host of PBS's Nova Science Now for Times 10 Questions. Neil, thanks for being with us today. I'm ready for you. What should be done about the fact that our kids lag woefully far behind children in other countries in the areas of physics and mathematics? You know what my first reply is? As a parent, mm -hmm. get out of there. Get out of there. Get out of there. When you're a kid, you're born a scientist. What does a scientist do? We look up and say, I wonder what that is. Let me go find out. Right. Let me poke it. Let me <laughs> break it. Let me, let me turn it around. This is what kids do. Mm -hmm. you, you can't let a kid alone for a minute without them laying waste to your house. Okay, because they're grabbing stuff off the shelf. And so what do we do? We prevent that. We prevent these depths of curiosity from revealing themselves, even within our own residences. And so I swore that when I had kids, and I do have kids, I got an 11 year old and a seven, but when they were young and still today, mm -hmm. if they see something they want to experiment with, even if they might break it, I just let it go. Let, it go. let, it go. let, it go. let the experiment run its course. Because therein are the souls of, is the soul of curiosity that leads to the kind of mind you would want as a scientist. So you talked about events that can cause the end of the world. Does this uh, knowledge keep you awake at night? Yes. Yes, it might keep me awake in a different way than others. There are many people who, when faced with disaster, impending disaster, they say to themselves, okay, let me buy emergency food, let me find a shelter to go to, let me alert, let me... When you're trained as a scientist or an engineer, that's not the first thing you think of. The first thing you think of is, how can I prevent a disaster? Right. Here comes the asteroid. You're gonna like run away from it? Or are you gonna say, how can I figure out how to deflect it? That's why you want scientists and engineers in your midst. Otherwise, you're just running away from every possible disaster <laughs> that could affect life on Earth. And what kind of life is that? What is the most astounding fact you can share with us about the universe? The most astounding fact. The most astounding fact is the knowledge that the atoms that comprise life on Earth, the atoms that make up the human body, are traceable to the crucible that cooked light elements into heavy elements in their core under extreme temperatures and pressure. These stars, the high mass ones among them, went unstable in their later years. They collapsed and then exploded, scattering their enriched guts across the galaxy. Guts made of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and all the fundamental ingredients of life itself. These ingredients become part of gas clouds that condense, collapse, form the next generation of solar systems, stars with orbiting planets. And those planets now have the ingredients for life itself. When I look up at the night sky, and I know that yes, we are part of this universe, we are in this universe, but perhaps more important than both of those facts is that the universe is in us. When I reflect on that fact, I look up. Many people feel small because they're small and the universe is big, but I feel big because my atoms came from those stars. If you could meet and talk with any scientist who's ever lived, who would it be? Isaac Newton. Why? No question about it. Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton. The smartest person ever ever to walk the face of this earth. You read his writings. The man was connected to the universe in spooky ways. The most successful scientists in the history of the world are those who pose the right question. If I ask you, at what temperature does the number seven melt? <laughs> What's the square root of a pork chop? These are meaningless questions. Maybe <laughs> philosophers would relevant, with them, but scientific, they're scientifically meaningless. Abandon them, go on to the next problem. Newton, his question was reached into the soul of the universe, and he pulled out 
insights and wisdom that transform our understanding of our place in the cosmos. Mm -hmm. Somebody said, Ike, why is it that planets orbit in the shape you call ellipses rather than circles? Why that shape? And he said, you know, I, I'll get back to you on that. I'll get back to you. Goes away for a few months, come back. Here's the answer. Here's the answer. Here's why gravity produces ellipses for orbit. Guess, well, how did you find figure that? Well, I had to invent this new kind of mathematics to do it. He invented calculus. Most of us sweat through it for multiple years in school just to learn it. He invented it practically on a dare. He discovered the laws of motion, the laws of gravity, the laws of optics. Then he turned 26. Okay? I'm with you. And I own everything he's ever written. Most of which written in his time, in his day. Mm -hmm. I commune through time as I read, as I read, as I read, as I read, as I read transporting me into a time and a place where people were just figuring out how this universe worked. And for me, that's thrilling and humbling. The subatomic particles we see in nature, the quarks, the electrons, are nothing but musical notes on a tiny vibrating string. What is physics? What is the physics? laws of harmony that you can write on vibrating strings? What is chemistry? The melodies you can play on interacting vibrating strings. What is the universe? The universe is a symphony of vibrating strings. And then what is the mind of God? That Albert Einstein eloquently wrote about for the last 30 years of his life. We now, for the first time in history, have a candidate for the mind of God. It is cosmic music resonating through 11-dimensional hyperspace. So first of all, we are nothing but melody. We are nothing but cosmic music played out on vibrating strings and membranes. Obeying the laws of physics, which is nothing but the laws of harmony of vibrating strings. But why 11? It turns out that if you write a theory in 15, 17, 18 dimensions, the theory is unstable. It has what are called anomalies. It has singularities. It turns out that mathematics alone prefers the universe being in 11 dimensions. Now, some people have toyed with 12 dimensions. At Harvard University, for example, some of the physicists there have shown that a 12-dimensional theory actually looks very similar to an 11-dimensional theory, except it has two times, double times, rather than one single one time single parameter. Time. parameter. Time. Marrow, no, 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 no